Hello and welcome to Gratitude Space Radio. I am Chris Palmore and this is the Productive Accident, Accident Series and I've got my co-host and good friend Peter Williams in Hong Kong I'm going to bring on right now. Uh, Peter, how you doing, man? Doing well, thanks, Chris. Looking good forward morning. To this yeah, we've got a we've got a world famous author here that just told us that he keeps his books away so he doesn't feel like he's starting from zero every day, which I definitely want to dig into. Um, and I wanted to speak real quick. You know, I, I really love his book, Itchy Go Itchy. And before I bring him on, I just want to say uh, what he said. I'm just read just read shortly from his book here. It says, uh, Itchy Go Itchy depends on our ability to listen, see, touch, smell, and savor every moment, doing only one thing at a time and putting our heart and soul into it as if it were the last thing we were going to experience on earth. And then he goes on to say, to make this happen, we need to put our watches and cell phones away. So to to take a hexer thing here, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my airplane mode on here, and I'm sitting this. I'm gonna watch this. Here we go. I'm gonna push that guy right over there. So I'm uh I'm getting rid of that stuff. And it says the moment is. I love this. Very poetic. He says the moment is a jealous lover that demands we give it all of our t- all, to give it our all. Every re, re, unrepeatable moment is a small oasis of happiness. And many oases together make an ocean of happiness. So those are the words of Mr. Hector Garcia, who we have here is in Tokyo. And we're welcome in here, him here now. Uh, hey, Hector, how you doing, man? Hello. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yes, oh, I, I also have my, in fact, I don't have my phone nearby. This is far, it's far away. I'm here with you in this podcast and just to... It's the first time. So it's also, it's the first time I meet both of you. This time it's virtual. Uh, so this is an Ichi, Ichigo ETA. It's also about the moments that we live It's with other people. So it's right. kind of like, my, it's like a shared mindfulness. Like we have to be present. And yeah, next time we might meet again in the future. I don't know if in Hong Kong, in Kentucky or Tokyo, we might meet again. But it will not be the same. Uh, we will, all three of us will be older. Uh, you would already know my personality. I would know yours. So mm-hmm. it will be kind of different always. And so that's why we are going to live a Ichigo Ichi time here together, the three of us. And all the listeners too. It's the first time we, we meet. Yes, this is. I wanted, I wanted to say Ichigo Ichi to both you all, you know. Just straight up. Uh, this is like you said, I, this is a once, this is only occurring right now. And I'm, I'm so glad just to be here and to be present. And, uh, this, the magic of this moment, you know, just, uh, every moment is magical, but speaking in these moments, uh, you know, I just want to say with, with Hector down there, you know, there's so many people that I, that I have to think just that, that led me to Hector. Cause I, I, I like this, like, you know, this, there's gratitude obviously and Hector writes books, right? He writes amazing books. And that's how people know Hector. But, uh, you know, my friend Bobby Koontz, uh, a year ago, basically, he's like, you need to meet uh, Sean Anderson. He's another writer. He said, uh, you need to interview him. So I interviewed Sean. And then I asked Sean, do you know any people that I could interview? And he said, yeah, Dr. Elise uh, Cortez. So then I talked to Dr. Elise Cortez and I'm and she go, I go, OK, before I you know have, meet you, can you re- refer to me one of your podcasts? And she goes, uh, she sent me Hector Garcia. She sent me oh, Hector oh. Garcia's podcast. Mm-hmm. So oh, I guess that was a year ago. I heard you and I go, I heard you on her podcast. And I was like, I like this guy. I'm totally digging what he's talking about this book. I would love to interview this guy. But I put what I, at that moment, what I did, I wasn't reaching out to you. I just put your book in my queue on Amazon. And then it sat there for a while. But um, eventually I... Be grateful I, to Amazon too. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, so I, I eventually I read it and then I re- read your other uh, another book of yours and another book. And um, and I was thinking, man, I would love after reading Ichigo Ichi, I was thinking I would really love to be able to just talk with this guy because it just resonated so much with me because I feel like, you know, being great, being present is such a massive component to being grateful. If you're not in the mo- if you're not showing up like you're not appreciating where you are, or who you're with, then um you're almost in a, in, you know, it's like you're in a busy state, which when you're busy, it's very easy to be ungrateful because you're not being present. So, um, so thank you. I do want to thank those, those combinations of people that led to this moment. 
Thank you. I've got one yeah, question. I'm remembering Hector. now Ali's podcast. That was fun. Thank you, Alice. Yeah. Yeah. Hector, you know, I like how you, you, you say it at the beginning of a conversation, and I think you also say it at the end, potentially, right? As a sort of a parting phrase. But what if what if you're meeting someone that you don't really like or that is a, an enemy kind of thing? Would you, argue, would you argue with hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> Enemies. Yeah, I, I like the. But that that's also so. I would take it. Okay, I like this. This is how I would think about it. I would think it also as a, if you start thinking. I would also take it as an opportunity to take it all in. If it's uh, if you are really in the moment with this enemy or person maybe let's let's have a concrete example you are you have to deal with uh, let's say you have your own business and you have one of those clients you have like 10 clients and there is one that is very annoying let's say it's like you have to deal is the type of client that is high maintenance and mm -hmm. you have to deal with it so you can change your perspective every time you can start looking at things on like how this client uh, thinks about maybe he's going through a hard time and that's why it's a little bit annoying mm. and also you can take it for yourself as a as a lesson for as a lesson for yourself if you are present and you you can start learning about this enemy or this this client that you don't like what are the features of this now i'm thinking like an engineer yeah i'm i was I was a, an engineer <laughs> before a writer. Yeah. So then next time you will know better in life which type of people to start engaging with and which ones you don't like to engage mm. with. Does mm. it make sense? Then you will be more your sensors to those things. And I think in a natural way that happens as we grow old, when we are in our 20s, we, we become friends with everyone. And I think that's good too. But after a while, you also learn how to what type of people you feel more comfortable and happy around. So yeah. I think it's also, but if you are not present also with those people, then you might fall again and again. And you might be in your 40s and 50s with four or five, five clients that you hate and you have to deal with them. Yeah, it so could be a missed I think, opportunity, I think, the way you're saying it, right? Because you can always learn from either through being curious or alert or empathetic, etc. right? Exactly. Uh, and another thing that and maybe some people that might think the reverse, I'm, I'm becoming more, even for the people, I'm coming more like the people who are like, might be a little bit annoying or like for you, it might be also you who is in or it might be that, that that person needs needs help or is going through a tough thing in their lives and they, they cannot share it with you mm -hmm. so so also be under have like em, more empathy and compassion so yeah. that's how i'm looking at, at all my people around me my friends or people that might be so I, i'm trying to be more compassionate that's how i'm taking it I so you've been You've been living in in Japan. I think you mentioned around seventeen years. When did you yes. start getting interested in writing this book? For I guess people that don't live in Japan that may not be as aware of the whole concept of ichigo ichi. So I always the, the the books I've I've I write they always come from I'm analyzing myself like they always come from two parts. It's like things things I don't understand and I'm trying to understand myself. So that's how that's how I wrote my first book when I arrived to Japan. Uh, you, you have also been here in Japan and the first time is kind of like... It's, you different like, as a, yeah, it's like, sure. I always have the... It's like landing in a different planet. Yes. Because there is... You go to the streets and you don't understand anything. And, and not only the language, but all the brands and things are new. So you go to a supermarket, and you don't you don't even know how to buy 
I remember very clearly, okay, I have to buy shampoo or body soap and I don't know that you, you don't know the brands so you don't know yeah. the difference. So in a sense, that's hard. It's like sometimes it's like, okay, how do I deal with life in this new planet called Japan? Or it can also be very, for me, it was a very weird feeling like being a kid again when you were five years old and you're walking on the street with your parents you're asking you're learning to read and you're asking about everything you're very curious mm. and when we become older we we become used to everything and we we kind of take for granted the beauty of where we live our home country or home place and that that's how I arrive here and I don't understand anything. I have this curiosity that it's like like a kid. Mm. And I started making many questions to Japanese people and traveling around Japan and reading many, many books. And I started writing like to, to understand all the answers. Like, what does this mean? Why mm. do Japanese behave in this way? Why Japan, blah, 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 like many questions. And that's how I wrote my first book, A Geek in Japan. Uh, a Geek in Japan is like a book that is like the 101 for Japan. So if, we, if you're already an expert in Japan, it might be not a book for you. But if you want to get started, like a jump start into what Japan is, A Geek in Japan, I think is still is one of the top selling books about Japanese culture. Mm. And it's the Venn diagram, right? Where you, you find your purpose basically at the intersection. Ah, no, uh, yeah, that, that's that's seeking that's my next books. So ah. then I, I changed my and after after a geek in Japan, <clears throat> I I started writing books more based on concept uh, on very concrete concepts of Japanese culture or Japanese words that I've concepts that I felt should be i felt would be useful for the rest of people outside of japan mm -hmm. and that's where i wrote about the concept of ikigai which is the purpose of our lives ikigai means in japanese uh, the purpose of your life mm -hmm. or the, what is worthwhile doing or i like it what makes you jump from bed every morning and look forward to your days and then another book is Ichigo Ichie. That is the one that we started talking. The first concept that is Ichigo Ichie. It's an expression that is written when you do tea ceremony in Japan. Uh, you go into a tatami room with it usually has views to a garden. And Ichigo Ichie, it's a it's written many not not always but many times in this tatami room it's written in a scroll ichigo ichie mm. and that word is reminding you that while you're doing the tea ceremony you shouldn't you, you are not allowed to have your smartphone in the room and you are also not there are some rules like you cannot talk about mundane things you cannot talk about the news or politics while you are doing the tea ceremony when you see the scroll that is telling you Ichigo Ichie, it's like you have to be in the moment with your green tea. And uh, there is people around you also enjoying the green tea with you and you can talk with them, but you have to talk about what you can see. You can talk about the garden, the flowers, right. you can talk yeah. about the taste of the tea. So that's that's Ichigo Ichie. It's a form of mindfulness so, in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, it's mind. It's a shared mindfulness. It's not mm. like mindfulness and meditation these days. Is More it personal. might be for you or not? It's like mm. you have to be by yourself meditating. Mm. So it's being mindful with collectively. Yeah, collectively. Yeah, excellent, Chris. Yeah. Do you want to go I into your standard gratitude questions? I. For sure, yeah, Hector. Um, you know, this being this is gratitude space radio. We, uh, if you know, what do you? What would be your definition of gratitude? Like, how how would you express that? If you were to write a short essay to, to gratitude, say you wanted a child to get it, how would you express that? 
Mm. Another very, <laughs> you might be the expert in this gratitude. Uh, well, are, are you could, I, I mean, think... you know, you could talk about how itchy go itchy, how, I mean, I was even walking in the park today thinking about you can't have one without the other, you know, um, but if you're, you know, if you're not comfortable answering that question, that's okay. I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm very, so what I've noticed is that, so what, one thing I've noticed in, in myself is that, like, when when I'm feeling the most unhappy in my life, mm -hmm. when I'm having, like, we all have ups and downs, one of the reasons is that I'm I'm having many ne negative thoughts in my mind, and those negative thoughts are usually because I'm focusing on the like might be like two three little things that are not going okay in my life, but there is there are like ninety nine things that are going perfect, and that's the that's a very interesting human nature thing i feel like we we're focusing on those three things that and also i think it's like type a personality which i'm a little bit of that and that's right i also write books to help myself and i think mm -hmm. that's why it resonates yeah. i wrote ichigo ichie because i'm the type of person that i i'm, I'm many times i'm with people I'm, I'm inside my mind so i wrote a book for myself to heal myself and be more present in the moment so maybe i need to write a book about gratitude maybe i don't know if the japanese but yeah when i we notice can work on that, that. <laughs> when when i notice or maybe you have to recommend me books on that when i'm noticing that it's usually okay i have to shift and i do i do write sometimes i write a diary i've done this since i was 15 years old even before so mm -hmm. i have this habit and when I notice these times that I'm like, I try to focus on writing beautiful things and be, it's like a gratitude journal that that are going well in my life. And that, I think that helps me a lot, like to write down which are the, and lately I'm doing something since Corona started because it's difficult for all of us. I'm writing one that is monthly, like what are the, because I don't know for you, but it feels with Corona like the time passes like faster or slower. I don't know mm -hmm. because we like we are in a routine. But I write down my biggest, like the most things that I'm more grateful for the last month. So, for example, this yesterday I wrote the best things in February. So mm. I wrote, and you will be my list for March. I will write down, <laughs> okay, I was in Gratitude Space Radio, and that was fun. So that that helps me to refocus uh, like into gratitude. And I don't know if I have any Japanese example on gratitude, but... I would say that many times the, from the outside, there are many stereotypes on Japanese culture that they might focus. But I also believe that they might be like very like, they work a lot, they are too focused on like effort. And, and that's true, but when you get to know them, the Japanese people, they're also very humble and simple and they, they are happy with all the small things and they just do mm -hmm. these efforts like so they i think inside them they are grateful for that they, they they have less ambi they have much less the word uh, ambi i haven't found many japanese who are very ambitious they are very always humble and by doing little things every day they mm -hmm. might achieve great things uh, I think that contrasts with U.S. culture, where it's like success. And for example, I think Japan is the third economy in the world now after China and the U.S. But if I ask you, do you know any famous Japanese billionaire? You 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 cannot say they they don't try to they don't try to stand out. They try to like live their lives in in. A, that's what I, I mean, I, maybe I'll introduce a little bit about how we discovered Japan and it, it links back to the, mm. this concept of productive accidents as well. 
Um, and, you know, my first, I guess, uh, memories of, of Japan is when we just happened to go, um, uh, it was, I think it was March uh, one year, it was probably about 15 years ago, and we just happened to arrive in Tokyo and it was peak uh, Blossom Festival. So that alone was was a productive accident or serendipity in, in some ways. And uh, we had a, a great experience going to uh, Shinjuku Park and was amazed at, at uh, you know, the picnics that were going on. And then later in the day, we went past and there were people out with disco balls hanging from trees and beer kegs. And I was going, these guys really know how to party as well. You know, like it caught me by surprise. You know, yes. they, in the, early in the day, it was quite mild and timid. But by the end of the day, uh, they were having a lot of fun. I think alcohol helps there too. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, it's like um, Sakura Blossom. It's like one of the yeah. biggest let's get drunk in the nature parties yeah. in the world. <laughs> yeah, that was a good good introduction to, to Japan. And then we actually went down. Um, we only had a week, but we managed to fly in via Tokyo and out via Osaka. And that meant that we were able to go across to Kyoto for a day. And we actually went down to Hiroshima and went to the museums. And that was a memorable thing as well. But because we had um, our two young daughters at the time there, we also went to Disneyland twice, you know, Disneyland, Disney Sea. That was, that was an experience that I wasn't expecting uh, how big they were. And I just remember how patient the children were waiting in oh. queues that were an hour long. Like our kids were getting impatient and these kids were just like, you know, just just go with the go with the flow. Uh, that was impressive. Um, then we moved. We were living in Singapore at the time. We moved to Hong Kong, and this idea of productive accidents. But I'll, I'll just introduce briefly so you understand the concept because it actually does overlap to some of the the ideas that were in uh, Ichigo Ichiya because this idea of, of paying attention to serendipity or connecting dots or unexpected things. I think you even spoke about um, the Bill, the uh, Steve Jobs examples of him, you know, maintaining curiosity and dropping in on calligraphy classes, which at the time you'd think, how does that relate to computing, et cetera, or innovation? But it ended up becoming the insight to have type fonts on the original Macs, and mm -hmm. that was a differentiator for, for that, you know, for them. Um, but productive accidents refers to this idea of our conversation today, right? These random conversations that can turn into interesting connections and over time potential collaborations and, and adventures and, and everything else. It started as an idea for um, how does innovation happen? You know, you can either stay in your closed network and, you know, live in a silo or you can, you know, be curious and connect to different people. And something that's routine in your life could be revolutionary in, in mine or, or Chris's. And, and in fact, that's what you've effectively done with your book. Mm. You've taken something that's routine in Jap Japanese culture and you've shared that to the rest of the planet. And, uh, you know, that's that's got value in itself. Mm. Um, and you mentioned how you started to do your, your gratitude uh, journaling Chris has taken that to another level by publishing letters of gratitude. So last okay. year he did uh, an anthology of letters. And the great thing about that is it gives people um, who might be thinking about writing a book, but that's too big a jump, but they could write a thousand word essay. And, you know, Chris gave people that opportunity, which was amazing. So I wrote one of those, my daughter wrote one. Um, and then subsequently he's, he's got another project that's happening parallel called Dear 2020. And thinking back, even though you say, you know, 2020 was a tough year, there were good things if we, if we you know, pay attention that we want to acknowledge. Um, so anyway. Yeah, we, I love, we, I love yeah. the word serendipity. Mm -hmm. It's one of my, I love like, and also the productive accidents. Mm -hmm. I, I like that, the concept. I'm also big into a small random act. I think it's called random acts of of kindness so yeah. that's also mm -hmm. like being uh, and it, it doesn't need to be i think that's also your philosophy it doesn't need to be something very big sometimes just a little thing like if you have a friend who is feeling down and you just send them a beautiful message on like whatever it might make a good day for them yeah and that good day for them might change so i i like this concept it might sound naive but the concept of like the butterfly effect mm -hmm. 
Yeah. If and I, th- I think for that books and you, if you don't, I always think like you don't need to be a writer to to be able to do these things. Books are very powerful because they have this. You read a book and you get inspired and you start doing something. But podcasts these days are yeah. also huge. So if you are better at talking and interviewing, like your podcast might be, you might think, oh. But I started a podcast, and these days there are all these numbers out there. But if you have a podcast and you have like 300 people or 100 people listening, if you imagine those people like going through their lives and being inspired by your podcast, and those people might inspire other people, then yes. there is this butterfly effect, like serendipity, serendipity happens. Um, I think it's and that's it very. That's what I yeah, like it about. compounds. So that's that's why you shouldn't feel like these days. Oh, these these days of social networks that this person has all this. So I am very big in that and, and serendipity to like you 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 never know. Yeah. And also about friends and connections, like you said, like with uh, yeah, like I think it's more valuable sometimes, and I think I was a little bit like this also in the past. I like I was originally an engineer, and I was always surrounded by the same type of people by engineers, which mm-hmm. they might be very smart or not. But when you have very smart people together, that they are all specialized in the same thing, I have the feeling that you you're using also the word innovation. And I like innovation doesn't happen. It's like it just it's just incremental. Like it's like okay, you just improve things. Yes. And I have found that the most value in my life has started coming when I have started making friends totally outside of my unrelated. Like, started hanging out with artists or like whatever. Like the most like totally. And at the beginning, you find my you might. Feel a little bit uncomfortable, like, like what this mm-hmm. person is thinking totally different things from me. Yeah. But then ideas from those conversations that with people who are, who are outside of your circle, they will add the most value yes. to your life. But, and I think that's true what... for for business too. Like if you start doing business yeah. with a yeah. that's exactly what productive excellence is: is to be the bridge between disconnected industries mindsets, locations. Um, in, in fact, a lot of it is reinforced in this idea of diversity and inclusion. Like, why do we want diversity? It's, it's so that we're not all thinking the same thing, you know, when people bring their different perspective to business or to life in general. Um, the, the backstory on how we got involved in Japan, later on, we moved to Hong Kong and I started playing tennis. And I met a, um, uh, I ended up being, being invited to become the captain of the team. And my first reaction was, that sounds like a bunch of admin. Why would I want to do that? But I, I paused and I went, well, hang on. What's the makeup of the team? And there were, there were 40 players from fresh grads out of university up to retired partners at law firms and investment firms, lots of different industries, lots of different nationalities, lots of different skill sets. So I, I thought, well, this looks like a recipe for productive accidents. And so I, I said yes. And I sent a, a survey to the team saying, you know, like, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Do you have any children? You know, I was trying to look for overlap. Maybe they go to the same school as our children. Um, you know, how are we going to win this next tournament? But the best question I asked was, you know, just tell me a fun fact. Tell me something interesting about yourself. And that's what led to um, a response from a, a new friend who grew up in Boston, who said, look, after 20 years of investment banking along the way, they bought land in Niseko. And, uh, you know, now they're doing property development up there. And I was like, well, what's Niseko? And he said, well, ski. how to snow heaven. And, uh, you know, I grew up on a skateboard and a BMX bike. I'd always been interested in snowboarding, but had never gotten around to it. You know, living in Singapore, not a lot of snow. Australia, why bother? Um, which is where we're from, because even though they have snow, it, it, it doesn't have, you know, the same sort of reputation as, as other places. Anyway, five emails later, we had our first trip to Niseko. We went back the following year. This was back in 2012. Um, went back the following year. Then these friends created a, a summer camp for children in Hokkaido. And they invited our eldest daughter to be like an intern. We went along there and we realized, wow, um, you know, summer is even better than winter in, in Japan because you've got mountain biking, camping, hiking, rafting, all these amazing things. 
um, yeah, then my wife and I worked out of out of Tokyo for a week, and that was an amazing experience. And then we discovered Fuji Rock Festival, and so the oh, last three years row, we've been camping there with teenage daughters. We ended up buying land and building a house up there. Is is the long, you know, the, the oh, end wow. conclusion. So that's what, how we end up in Japan quite a bit, and and how we spend some time in Tokyo. But yeah, anyway, I, I want to talk more about some observations of Japan later on, but. I'm thinking um, many Chris, serendipity what are, what are, things. One, one of many. my one of my editors also has something in Niseko, so okay. yeah, like that. <laughs> we will convert. <laughs> in, one in one in of my editors in has a place in Niseko too. Excellent. You know, speaking of this serendipity idea, I, um, I. I, you know, when, when I speak about gratitude, I've told Peter several times, you know, if you, I have this, this theory, to, theory called gratitude cubed, it's where you, you know, if you're in a grateful state, you can look back and see these connections. Like, for instance, when I started with talking about how I met Hector, I can get very excited because I go, oh, you know, I have a friend named Bobby, you know, and Bobby led me here. It, it's, like, it's almost like they're productive accents because these are all serendip. If you, bottom line is I want to feel like I want to feel like life is magical. And that's, and that's where we, serendipity comes in. You can go, because bottom line, people can go, oh, okay, well, it all makes sense. It happened. Or you can go, wow, it's amazing. It's really a mindset of like, are you looking at these as like, oh, obviously, well, I, I go, obviously, well, I know Bobby. And then Bobby introduced me to him. You know what I mean? Like there's a boring, there's a way to be boring about it, right? Or there's a way to be excited about it. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I like that. Like be, make it magical. That's that's inter yeah. When do you think? I think everyone's, and, and that's also another thing that I, I've reflected. Like also, P Peter said, like asking the question, "What is the most?" I don't know exactly what you said. Like you asked your friend, "What is your people in your tennis club? What is the most interesting thing in your life?" So th those kind of questions are very interesting. Also, to get into to, to know what's interesting in in another person's life or you might ask yourself that question to to see what's interesting which i think we all have like interesting things in our lives is getting yeah so that's so i mean one of, one like of the connect, things, connecting the typical thing about connecting the dots of and sometimes yeah. we don't i think writing if you don't like writing you can even i think Writing is a very powerful tool, but if you're not into writing, you can also explain to your friends, this is how things happen. And you can mm. you can have a sense of meaning and also for bad things. Like I think it helps if you if you go through something that might be traumatic in your life and you are kind of blocking it and you are like kind of you don't want to even talk about it. Sometimes I think it's good, like you put a storyline, these went bad and i went through this traumatic event in my life and then and then you can cut and and say okay and from this moment everything started changing and yeah. you might be some listeners might, might be listening now and say hey hector but now i i am now in my my traumatic event and i don't know how to get out so that's another situation i know that that's that's hard and but I think and that also helps like w w to to put some to tell the story inside your mind like okay I've been through all this hard time I'm now in a very bad moment in my life and you can also put some even if it's little things like like what where you want to head forward like okay this is one what I want to and don't think that you are alone in in your life like see which people like you can start talking with and those might bring serendipity and bring you yeah. out of that bad situation totally agree i've got um i've discovered people uh that have actually started speaker series um after going through traumatic things as well and sharing their story has been part of the solution for them mm -hmm. um so i totally agree with what you're saying one of the the best bits of japan or you know good introductions even though you might think it's very westernized and whatever but I thought Lost in Translation was a great movie. Um, it, it is. It is very good. Yeah. It's subtle, but I've met people that are very extreme. They either hate it or they love it. And, you know, I've, I've watched it multiple times. I, I loved it. 
Um, yeah, I partly think, because I think, I think, it's the, I think it, is, it is the perfect movie to watch after you come to Japan and you come back home and you mm. watch Lost in Translation. It will get you into a weird mood. Yeah. If I if I watch Lost in Translation here in Tokyo, it's like, okay, I, yeah. don't, I don't <laughs> feel like... But if I'm back in Spain on a holiday or something, if I watch Lost in Translation, I will feel like kind of a nostalgia thing. Yeah. Which, yeah. It's a great soundtrack as well. So, how did you end up in in Tokyo? Like, what is your story? Let's go back and and get your journey. I think that's really interesting. Cause, Cause, yeah, because sound like we just it. you are you showed up and you were just there. So, how did yeah? What oh, was yeah, the just, what were the baby jerk, steps? Like, yeah, before <laughs> what was it before? Like, like, <laughs> like a, one of those in the movies. Like you you were just there and start the movie. So right. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm originally from Spain, uh, from a very uh, I was. I lived all my childhood in a very, I would say now in perspective, like talking about gratitude. I I took for granted how beautiful uh, all my childhood was in a Mediterranean village. Mm. There was like ten thousand people, so it's very small. So at the end, I was there eighteen years. So at at the end, like all the kids, there is one only one school and. Everyone is friends with everyone. And the beach and the Mediterranean Sea was like mm. two minutes walk from home. And it's like almost all the time good weather. It's very similar to weather in California, like Los Angeles, I think. Almost never raining. Very like perfect, perfect childhood, I, I would say. Like also mm. like very my part like very good i have a brother and fa my family my parents and the perfect place in this mediterranean village but at that moment of of course because i'm young I, I, i'm also very curious it's like i wanted to get out of there and discover the world that was the i didn't have the intention to to come to japan i had the intention to to leave that little village and go somewhere else and explore the world. In fact, one of the, my main options was to go to United States, and I was—I can say I, the word—I was a nerd, and I think I'm still are like computer nerd, like programming computers. I wanted to go to Silicon Valley, and yeah, that—that that was my plan. But of course, like many things in serendipity or life, like things don't always go. Th like you planned and i think that's okay because i think that's that's what made me if i went to yeah I, that's what made me arrive to japan it was like just i finished computer science studies in spanish university and i applied to many how do you say like yeah scholarships or like mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to internships i applied to many yeah. internships and things so I, I took the strategy. This is also a thing that I've also used this strategy for book publishing. My first book, A Geek in Japan, and nobody knew me in the publishing industry. So I sent emails to more than 50 publishers in Spain, and, and all of them ignored me except one. Uh, and that's the one that kind of changed my life <laughs> and made me a writer because then I had the first book and with the first book, then it's easier. So it's always when you are outside of something, and this might also be a complaint, like some, when you are outside of something, it's always, I think that's it's still true. Even it's always difficult to enter because there are always, you call them in English, barriers, door, 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 door keepers, like there is an mm -hmm. industry or like group of people and you might be your gatekeepers. And, but I found that many times if you are bold and you, you take the strategy of like a salesman, like you try to do like a hundred calls and if one is successful, that, that's good enough. So for internships, I, do, I did the same thing. I applied for internships to many places in the world. Most of them were in the United States. I got rejected from all the United States internships and scholarships, so I was rejected. But I was not—I was, yeah—I was not 
sad because I got accepted to one, two, two internships, one in Switzerland and another one in, in Japan. Hmm. And I went first to Switzerland where I worked in the, in the particle accelerator that served. Mm. Yeah. Like, like, so, and from there I jumped to, I jumped to Tokyo directly with an internship that was one year. And then I found a job in Tokyo. So that's what led me like sending those internships like randomly, like it was serendipity. I got accepted to to one. Another option would have been to stay in Switzerland, but I decided to stay in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I stay, and the rest is like after four, after six years here, I, I got married and then life happened. So that's why I'm here now. In love, love also helps. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm still here in Tokyo. So but the, the beginning was totally random, and it was an act of like I want yeah. to leave this place. And now, after many years, I kind of want to not go back to my little village in the Mediterranean, but I want to spend more time there. So I want to shift. Like now, I'm almost, in fact, last two years because of COVID, I've been here in Tokyo all the time. But I want to spend more, like one two months, back mm. in my village next to the Mediterranean. Yeah which is now that I'm more grateful for what what we have there because I've seen the rest of the world is like wow this place in Spain is is kind of amazing and when I was a kid I wanted to live so that's it's it's amazing so I think what you've just described is the core idea of productive accidents so the, this professor had, that we had at, at business school went back a hundred years to look at how innovation happens and he boiled it down to the people that are more creative, innovative, et cetera, are constantly putting themselves at risk of these productive accidents. So the fact that you accepted that internship to Switzerland and then you decided, well, let's go and try Japan and you were just open to these possibilities is exactly how we, have, we arrived here today. So this time last year I was doing, um, I was trying to finish my book as well. Um, and I'd had the content for a long time. You know, I agree with what you said before, like writing, to me is a superpower because it ends up helping you learn more about yourself and helps you to articulate um, thoughts that have been, you know, you've, you've had ex available, but you haven't sort of organized them in, in a way. And the more you do it, the more you start to see, you know, dots that can connect and, and so on. So I was doing Seth Godin's workshop this time last year, the, the creatives workshop, which was, you know, hundreds of people around the world trying to finish creative projects, you know, poets, musicians, writers, and during that, someone mentioned um, gratitude and pasta, which got me curious because I was interested in, in this idea of gratitude. And ultimately, that led to an introduction to Chris. And if that introduction didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. And so I just find, you know, yeah, these possibilities. Probably, it's also the equation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to write an equation for serendipity, I think. You so know, so. I think. Well, <laughs> if, you get this, if you get weird about this, it all goes back. It, it all goes back to our to, to our parents. Like so, why would <laughs> this is not even into going to? If you get weird, like start thinking and thinking, like why why Peter, Chris, and Nectar, we are here now today. It all goes back because for some reason our parents fall in love. Like I don't know, forty forty. 40 60, years ago. Three years ago from that okay, period. You look much <laughs> I just turned 40 last week. So it's like, oh. for me, you have to teach me about how to deal with my 40s crisis. <laughs> so, yeah, I was thinking, like, yeah, like if you go back, back in time, it's like what made them, like, serendipity goes. And that makes you feel also grateful for, I think, going back to Japan, I think Japanese are much, much more grateful to their elders, like mm -hmm. grandparents, they they are much more respectful. From kids to to everyone respects the elders, like, and it's not because, like, and I think in other cultures we are losing respect for the elders. And I think this is something that Japan can teach everyone, because they are they are why we are here and they built the society that we are here. And sometimes we forget, we think like we, we are very arrogant, like, okay, 
everything that is new is better than it was and, and it's not always true so mm. that's if you go all the way back it's like like also Wait. seth, seth godding parents did a good job to make him the kind of person he is so he did the workshop yeah after many years and, and he's probably also he might be the person who has blocked the most in the world <laughs> yeah right. I, I mean that's, I, that makes a difference i would I was gonna say I love I love how you said bringing up the parents because uh, I was about three months ago my uh, my dad was mentioning that you know he he by the anniversary meeting my mom was coming up and he told me these stories of the college they went to and like he told me these stories for years right he's like I remember walking up the hill and there she was and this that you know my mom passed away years ago and that's kind of how my gratitude story started Hector but. Um, Speaking of what you're saying, it was the same time I was reading your books and I, it may have been even thinking about the butterfly effect and how you wrote really, you did a really great job of writing about that in Itchy Go Itchy. But when we, so my, the anniversary was coming up. I'd never been to this college. I said, dad, I said, you know, here's another benefit of COVID, right? Or the benefit of the time in the pause. I go, I go, you know, we could go, we could go on the anniversary. We could go to the college. We could go walk around and do that. You know, like mm. I said, I'm, I'm 40, I was 41 at the time. So it's like, he'd been telling me these stories since I was, could have a memory. So on that day, it was, I believe it was 52 years later since they met, right? We went to the college campus. We walked around. I got a picture of him standing right at the spot, you know, mm. where my mom, um, we walked around these places, went to the chapel. He's like, oh, I remember we'd go over here and, you know, we'd kiss over. It was, it was just, it was such a magical time. But where I'm speaking of this is, um, we ended up going to look at like the football field or something. Cause my dad was an athlete and he, for some reason had this memory he said, you know, I remember your mom and I, we drove one day to Western Kentucky, which was another school to just check it out. And he said, when we got there, it was closed. And I said to him, I said, wow, I was like, your whole life would be different. I probably wouldn't exist if that school would have been open. <laughs> You know, no, because, because I mean, he, they, if you That's just a little idea of like you, yes. if you change like the fact they go, who knows, like if they go to Western, maybe they don't end up being married. We could say that, right. Or they do have kids, but then the timing, everything, you know what I mean? Like that little, that little synchronicity of going, oh, they were closed that day. So we didn't end up even optioning going to that school. We stayed here, you know, like mm -hmm. this is little, like. It was just very magical to see these little, you know, these little, this little thing in time, right? Um, it's so cool. You have a, you have a movie there, Chris. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching Tom Hanks walking across the uh, university campus somewhere there. <laughs> time. Well, time they've done a couple of good travel, movies. Uh, Mr. Destiny with uh, G Jim Belushi. Yeah, Jim Belushi back in the '80s was really great with Michael Caine. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. But it's really great movie. It's called Mr. Destiny. So in the beginning of the movie, there's a kid, and he it's the he's playing baseball. It's like in high school, and he he strikes out, you know. And that moment, like you shift forward and you see where he is, who he's with, all this and that. So what happens is he's on his birthday, and he goes, "Man, he's like, I wish I would have." Like there's this moment where he says, you know, somehow you know he's like, "If only I could have," right? And mm -hmm. Michael Caine shows up, almost like this mystical figure, and he like snaps this the next thing you know jim belushi wakes up and he's in a mansion he's married to the you know the the the, the prom queen and he's and he's very successful and he's in this position where he hit the home run he won the game but it looks all good at first but then you realize there's some really big ugliness behind this fantasy with which has become his life you know uh, there's another great movie called the family man with nicholas cage i don't know if you guys have seen that either same premise too where he wakes up and he has a different life, the life he didn't have because of one, you know, what if I would have ended up with the girl? So I think it's fascinating. But uh, the cool no, thing, I like forgot. I the, the other one is that Bill Murray's, that, that one that you, she, he has to leave every day. Groundhog same day. day. Groundhog yes, Day. Yes, yes, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's There's a new version fun. with a similar idea that I just saw. It's at the cinemas right now called Palm Springs. And it looks, it's got good, good reviews. I'm actually thinking about trying to see it this week with my daughter, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the one on Hulu? Uh, the one with uh, the guy, uh, Andy Sandberg? I that is so, fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there's even another one that just came out on Netflix, I can share with you later, where they did it even where uh, they took that idea to another level. So mm -hmm. I don't, I just, you know, because I, I like this idea of like gratitude cubed and squared, you know, it's like, it's like I said, just 
knowing those little moments happen, looking back and seeing these these door, you know, these invisible doors that are closing and opening, just again, serendipity, right? You you see life as a magic in these magical yeah. moments. I mean, I'm I'm curious, Hector, how did you evolve, I guess, from um, an engineer into an author? So, you know, you, you weren't always going to publish that book. Tell, tell us about that story. Yeah, but sometimes now we are thinking a little bit about magic, magical things. and But I also reflect about the sometimes I think there are some things this might be there are in, inevitable things if you keep uh, and that this connects with ikigai like your, your purpose or what you truly like doing or what you're and and this is this is something that i think it is kind of except except like 1 2% of the population which it might be like when you are, for example, you are five years old and you start playing the piano and you keep playing the piano until you are 95 years old and you become one of the best piano players in the world. Or you start, like you said before, now comes to mind snowboarding and you start or a skate, like there is, you start snowboarding when you're five years old and then you become a professional snowboarder. This is very typical in like peak performance performance in sports or artists who stars when they are five ten years old and they they keep the same thing and we look at these people and i think it's beautiful to have these kind of human beings who are like wow they, they are just focused on one thing for all their lives and i think but when you look at the rest of the people we is not we don't have to feel bad like oh i'm not I don't know what really is my purpose in my life. I'm kind of lost. I've been changing. And I have the perspective that I think is it is good to start shifting or changing in your life to feel like I think, in fact, the, ba the bad thing is to keep doing things that you might be very happy for 10, 15 years doing something, some kind of work. Mm -hmm. But then you're like 35 and you feel like sometimes, you know, you start being unhappy and you might need to change. I think when unhappiness comes in our lives is because there is a tension on how you should start living in a new way. But you keep living like a 25 year old, like playing video games and eating Cheetos. But you have to do something. You have to grow a family. So your purpose in your life might be to focus 20 years on 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 making like on being a, a family person and then later in your life you might want to change and find a, a new hobby that makes you happy for the rest so i think it is in fact that there was there is also some research like most of the people even if you start working in a company as an employee like most of the people like more than 50% of the people, they never end up, you study something. And I think this is a little bit in Spain. I don't know if it's true in the US. In Spain, we have this thing that if you study this thing in the in university or college, then you have to become that. And I think that's true for very, some specific things that are also very important. If you study to become a doctor, I think it is very important that we need doctors in society. So if you are that type of personality, go go for it. We, we we need you. But most of the other people, like you study something and you start working in a company. And after some years, you end up doing something totally different. You might start as a software engineer, but then, then you realize that you you are good with people. And you enjoy more being with people than being alone programming computers. And then you end up in a sales department and you become a sales engineer. And suddenly you are like the, I don't know, the, the vice president of sales. And then suddenly they will ask you why you were an engineer and now you're doing sales. Mm. And it might be because that was uh, inevitable. Like that, that was 
really who you were and i think that's a good thing you don't have to feel bad that that's a that's a good path the bad path would be like to be 20 years in and realize i've been doing 20 years the same thing and i'm very good at it but i hate it and for me it's kind of a similar it's not like i hate engineer i i love it mm. i love being an engineer but one of the trends inside me that I noticed, you have to also notice these things when you're working, especially when you're young, because you might have done something because of what your parents told you or because all your friends are doing that or because that's what you feel society is telling you to do. And I think that's okay. We're kind of lost when we are in our 20s. But then you, you have to start with this, be more aware of what you really enjoy or not and start shifting or what you're good at. And something I noticed is that in my work as an engineer, I was always, I was not like, for example, when I was at CERN, which are the, might be the, the top engineers and scientists in the world, there are Nobel prizes there in the cafeteria. Yeah. So I felt like, okay, I, I am nothing here. I was like totally average or even not not a good like it was like below average they much more amazing people than me but i had something that i was good at after analyzing something a system or trying to solve a problem i was very good at writing down and explaining something in a very concise way mm -hmm. and that's something that people around me started noticing and I started, you have to also look for good, I think this this could be another long conversation, like good criticism and bad criticism. That's that's important to listen and take it sometimes seriously, sometimes. But I, I started taking, okay, I'm good at this thing. And I started noticing people around me, engineers were very bad at writing. So I started noticing this and doing i started doubling up like okay i'm going to do more documentation and writing for everyone and i kept doing that in japan and then i started doing that outside of my work i started writing in the same style so my my first style of writing is very i would say it's very cold it's like an engineer if you write uh, if you see my i started writing a blog in spanish that like I started in 2004 and I started writing a, about Japan and it looks like a software specification. Japan is like mm -hmm. this because of this and this and it was very <laughs> logical writing. So it was not good writing, but I started writing about Japan using my skills. So there is a transfer. You were talking before about different skills and disciplines. So yeah. you, you can see here I was writing, but I was not a good writer but I was putting my skills of, uh, as a software engineer. It was mixing inside mm. me. And that's what brought me at the end to publish my first book, A Geek in Japan, which as I explained before, it's a little bit like an encyclopedia. It's like one-on-one -on -one for Japan. Uh, it reads a little bit, it's entertaining, but you will feel my origins as an engineer in that book. And then, yeah. After that is where I started hanging out more with artists and writers and they started giving me, I started also reading more books outside of my comfort zone. I started reading more novels. I even started reading poetry, which yeah, it, that was kind of very boring for me at the beginning. Then I learned to under, to feel it or like to enjoy it. And that started changing me as a writer. Like, like my my you writing is probably, starting. You could probably so that, that's you. that's the story of like I don't know if that answers your question, but no, it does. You, it does. you might it's... feel that same thing in your life. Like, you some yeah. struggle inside you. It's like I'm doing this, but I feel I'm very good at that. And I think society these days allows us to be very flexible, except on those things that are as I explained before, that are needed by society. If you're going to be a doctor mm. yeah. or you are going to be an engineer building bridges, so uh, you have to be very focused on that. But the, the rest of us, we, we are flexible to, 
to mix the skills. That's, that's what I'm trying to navigate right now, actually. You know, because I've I've been very linear in my career, but I've done a lot of creative things and you know things with NGOs and other things. But I'm yet to turn it into my day job. That's kind of feels like you know the leap that uh, I'm trying to work out what is the best way to do that because. Yeah, I like how you've organically just evolved towards this and then, you know, eventually it makes sense to do writing full time. But I, I think, you know, your discovery of poetry in some ways could be linked back to your appreciation for coding because, you know, concise, elegant coding is... Uh, is yes, I'm also, I'm also thinking about that a lot. Like I mm. still do. I'm thinking that, yeah, programming... There is a conflation also, like that's this is also like programming computers and software engineer. It's felt like I don't think it's really an engine, it, it has some parts that is engineering, but engineering is also an art, I think. Like Definitely, it's, it, there is some because if you just build things like they should be, there is no innovation too. So if you do something crazy. It might feel crazy at the beginning, but then you are innovating and you're writing code is like is writing too. And being being simple, this is also something I think I this is the being simple and specific. This transfer to transfers to almost and the, I think this is true for Japanese artists. If you've been here, yeah, you know Japan, like how Japanese artists are very, there is word minimalism that I think is overused, but Japanese art are always, are most of the time about having the essential, what is the essential things. Mm. And I think this transfers to every, almost every human pursuit, pursuit like we, we get lost in many, many, complicated things and you can apply simplicity to everything to to engineering to to writing to art to to how you think you might think very complex like things but at the end of the day you you can go down and go to the core idea mm. and you can apply this to i'm going to make fun of myself you can apply this to 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 talking which is something I have to improve and become better at being concise and simple because I, I get, I talk like, you know, so like very good speakers in public speakers, they are very good. And I think the top podcast in the world are very good at giving, like talking very concise and simple, like the, the ideas. And I think that that's a superpower. I think I, I got it more or less with my, my writing is very simple, I think, yeah. or essential. I, think, I would use the word essential, going to the, what what is the essence of things. I like I, I, I like I, I like the way you talk, Hector. I feel like you're you're not scripted, and you're. I feel like you're here. It's a part of being present when your I mind's am. just. It's like it's a you know you're. It's it's not scripted. I like that. I think it makes you more real personally. Um, I I, I had a Thank question you. though. Oh, you're welcome, Hector. I. How, did you have your writing partner for the first book? The, the uh, no. that you ended up okay. I was curious because so yeah, I know I'm the three books tell, I wrote. I yeah, tell me how you so met so. how you met your writing partner because I'm, I'm yes. curious about that. Yes, so that's also serendipity. <laughs> so yeah, my he he is one of the persons who helped me to to change my style. That I, I I explained now how my style evolved from my first book. And now I write books with him and also by myself. And my my style has changed a lot thanks to him. And it's a, he's the type of person who likes, I'm guessing it's like Peter. He's he takes Japan as a hobby. So he he comes to Japan like once at least once per year and stays here, like travels around Japan. And he is a very well-known novelist in Spain. He has more, I always, yeah, I, I don't know. He has more than 50 novels written and published in Spain. So he's very well-known, but I, I didn't know anything about him. And one of the times he came to Japan, he sent me an email and we had dinner together. And we liked each other. And then it was a routine. Every time he came back to Japan, 
we did something to get there. And then there was one time that he came, I guess this is 2013, something like that. He came and I was going through a rough time in my life. I was rough time in my life. I was having uh, an illness in my in my intestine. It's it's called SIBO. It's a very weird illness and difficult to diagnose by Japanese. Uh, yeah, Japanese doctors didn't help much. So I was feeling bad like daily. It was one one of those chronic conditions that I and I didn't know how to deal with it. I was I was feeling very. It was kind of my worst years of my life. I didn't know how to deal with it. And like Fra Francesc is his name. He's the Spanish novelist. We went for a long walk in a Japanese garden in Tokyo, and I was very. I was kind of depressed, so my talking was like. And he, Francis, is also he's written many books about psychology in Spain. So, uh, the I started explaining him about ikigai and the concept of ikigai, and he liked it. And he said, "We should write a book about ikigai, and this will help as a therapy to heal yourself, and I will wow. help you through the." So he became my he uses the word sherpa sherpa <laughs> sherpa is like when you go because writing a book now peter that you know how hard like writing a book is not is not just writing it there is a whole when you think that it's finished the the, the peak is still very far yeah. away so frances became my partner to to be like my sherpa to be together with me until we finished uh, Ikigai, the book that I think, and I never mentioned this origin story in the book itself, Ikigai, but I think that's why it resonates with so many people in the world. It has been, yeah, it, it has sold now. In India, it was the top selling book in 2020. Like the wow. top, like all categories, everything, <laughs> like over. Which is kind of crazy when I think about Harry Potter and things like that. It's like, so I don't, I don't know why in India they love it so much, but I think one of the reasons is that somewhere hidden there in Ikigai, it's is the subconscious of myself struggling through my, my my illness and how to get out of it and how to deal with it. So I wrote a book to heal myself with the help of Francesc. And that and 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 he's also very good to make make things simple and sound the words more poetic, which which mm. like that. That's why I think the combination of all those three ingredients was what made Ikigai what what it is now. And yeah, now I think we were the beginning of a a phenomenon. Like now there. Are, Last time I counted, there are more than 50 books about Ikigai. Mm -hmm. And our book was the first one. We, we just put the, like, the first sparkle, and then now it's like, okay. Then, how, how, many languages yes. is, how many languages has that book been uh, printed into? So I think now the last number I have is 50, 59, which, <laughs> which makes it... Saying, dude, it <laughs> talk is, about some serendipitous there. <laughs> it wow. is in 15. I'm learning. I'm learning about there are many languages in India, so that's one of yeah, the tricks. Wow. Uh, did you 59. did you edit it yourself, or did you have someone else go through and? and no, uh, no, that's like we we did all the we did everything that, because so Francis he he likes that editing so that was oh, okay and we did a process of like very it was really writing the book together so we we did lots of in fact i have a call with him two days from now we're writing a new book now so we do these calls where we do a screen sharing mm -hmm. and we do heavy editing together and mm. that's also that was a an exercise also for me as a writer, I think you have to let go your 
if you're um, if you have experience now with editors peter like you have to let go your ego and have to even if there are two pages that you put lots of effort if it doesn't make sense you have to delete those pages the book yeah. will be better without those pages so i learned a lot i trusted francis he he's yeah he's had like yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd love to have a chat with him at some stage because uh yes. you know my my project is all self-written edited everything but it's deliberately intended to be like you know i, I literally call the first version 0, 0.0 because it's like a foundation but I'm interested in what happens next, you know, and creating new stories that emerge. So like you say, you know, getting it to the point where the first draft is finished, that was April last year. It took another four months to sort of go through, you know, just correcting errors and, and making, you know, making sure there's no repetition and other things like that. Oh, yes. but in the appendix, I was, I was keeping track of anything interesting that happened, any other productive ha accidents that were happening. And in some ways, COVID accelerated a lot of these things because things that used to be physical turned into virtual. So, you know, joining that gratitude and pasta dinner, meeting Chris, discovering, you know, all these other communities out there. And there's, there's 10 case studies that could turn into, you know, version 0 0.1, 0 0.2. But this idea of getting it edited in from someone else's perspective, I think is, is probably something I, I, I will think about as well. So thank you, it's a good idea. Yes. You know, speaking of my end, you know, having an editor was a total godsend, and uh, I, I would be law. I would have been lost without my editor. So, and but I was speaking of what Hector was saying. As a writer, you know, it's like I, I, I trust. You have to find somebody you trust, obviously, and then it's like it's okay for them to cut it if because when they, you might go, well, that's a really great story, but they might go, you might go, well, it's not important though. It's not getting, you know what I mean? It's not making what it is. It's making you've already made your point. It's like you're almost wanting to like make it grandiose but it makes you know what i mean it's like yes. what's what's the easiest what's the easiest way to get the it what comes down to we have a message right we're writing about a message what's the easiest way for that message to be received um and that and that's why i love yeah, having somebody some, else that i trusted some sometimes it's also better to lay to leave i also noticed this, there is something about the psychology of the reader that sometimes it's better to leave things unsaid and and let so you you are not treating the reader as a stupid person so you you are leaving some and i felt that's when also writing online this is very 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 interesting if you leave some things and set until like you leave like then you open more for this like discussion or imagination of like every reader will have their own opinion or whatever yeah uh, and i think that's also one of the keys of sorry to talk i feel like as a spanish i feel like talking too much about my book like in ikigai the first book we left many things unsaid about like so the main question is like we throw away the concept we we go and we talk with the elders like the longest living people in the world in okinawa and we explain how they live and how important having purpose in life is. But we don't we we give some clues on how you might find your purpose in life, but we don't give answers. Like we, we the, all that that's open. And that's one of the main criticism of, of the book out there. <laughs> and that's that but I think that's the reason of the its success because then we wrote a second book which now is starting to the second book is like 35 pragmatical actionable items that you can use to find your ikigai which is mm -hmm. the main question that people wanted and the second book is doing well but not as good as the first one that the first one has no answers the second one we give you a recipe like mm -hmm. this is what you have to do to find your purpose in your life so and i think but there is it depends on the personality there is many people who say that second book is much better than the second than, than the first one and we put much more effort in the second book at least my my because i had to think more like these 35 exercises mm. like like how how to find your ikigai how to find your purpose in life that's, that's a huge question so i took it very seriously 
and there is many people who it, I think it depends on the personality but I think in writing in general is good to may, sometimes depending on how what's your purpose to leave things unsaid or like and you might discover things about your readers like okay I thought this is how you interpreted this and then you start thinking oh that's how people think about this that's not how I thought so it, there is a conversation with your readers yeah it probably it's a good way of learning things as well right so, you know how to how to and I guess musicians do that right they don't explain their lyrics and they leave it open to interpretation and then mm, yes learn. that's music oh, no. that's true that's a mm -hmm. better analogy than right the music is like that it's like mm -hmm. your your there is a connection between and I think that's true for all art there is as an artist you have to try to remove yourself from your art and let it like it's 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 a collaboration between what you create and the peop your uh, like the, the the people who are going to look at your art listen at your art or read your art mm. it should be something there well, one thing i just remembered I, I was walking across a bridge uh, at a golf course in hokkaido and um, I, I don't know where I'd read about it, but these wooden um, structures, they often have a little zigzag halfway across the bridge. Yes. And I think it also refers to the similar idea, right, where you, it, it's forcing you to pause and uh, be observant, I guess, of, of that location or the beauty or the situation. Um, have you got other examples of where Japan has sort of, I guess, integrated this this idea into physical um settings mm, yeah i always think about those corners those mm. those bridges i always take a picture when a bridge in japan yeah, that's, a, that's a yeah. weird thing i i well i think the obvious uh, is my kind of relate but the main thing the main thing is like the way and I'm not an expert in this, but the way Japanese gardens are designed is kind of the same thing. It makes you, it's a very different thing, experience to be in a, uh, it comes to mind, a garden in in France, in mm -hmm. a French castle that everything is straight it's lines. Like yeah, very and you, you want things to be symmetrical and grandi grandiose. Mm -hmm. And it's just it, it's made to make you feel like a sense of awe. That's very I don't know if but that, that's a general. I think that comes from the Greeks and Romans that were. You might have also noticed that in in yeah in Europe or like I shouldn't say Europe, but in general, more Western culture like the the facade. Like what you see in a, in a house from the is the most important thing. Uh, you must have also noticed, Peter, that in Japan is not always is most of the time the front of the house or the main view of a garden or something. Is that's not not the main point. Mm. The, main, the main point is the experience when you go inside the house and you go inside this room with the tatami and you open this window that suddenly through the window it makes you feel a sense of oh wow now i can see i can see the garden from the window and it looks like a painting or it, it, it feels it feels unreal mm. but you have to go inside and and the house from in from outside it looks very normal and and, and subtle and humble so mm -hmm. it's not you you are not trying to to impress but you're trying to make the person go through an experience that is more subtle that's uh, yeah that, that's also done through the like mm. the Makes sense, the, yeah. the bridges and so you, and, and the, that the sometimes thing. it might feel like the first time when i was young and the first time i came to japan it felt weird because in europe i maybe i was a little bit arrogant in europe we have this incredible cathedrals and impressive mm. things so i was used to the thinking oh the more bigger this is also very western the bigger 
the more complicated, like you you know, Baroque style, and also in Barcelona we have the Gaudi familia that is like mm -hmm. takes hundreds. And then I came to Japan, and you go to a temple that is supposed to be one of the most important in Japanese culture, and it's just four good things put together. And it's like, okay, I can put these good things together. Uh, so this is like, that that was my Western stupid way of thinking. Now I see it more Japanese, like to, 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 to make these simple, good buildings like Shinto shrines. It's also not trivial. It takes lots of, uh, like, it's a, it's about the, it's not more like to 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 impress, but it's about the tradition that the way these Shinto shrines is being built is the same way that it was done like like three thousand, four thousand years ago. It's the same. They they follow the same uh, way of building it. This is this. In fact, it's the same lineage of families like building the the Japanese shrines, which in Europe is not is not true like yeah. we care of how we, we, it looks but we are using modern cranes and things to build our our churches and cathedrals we are using build like modern technology in japan to build to build like the, for example the Ishi shrine which is rebuilt every 20 years like you cannot use you cannot use metal nails to build the the, mm. the shrine. You have to use only wood, mm. which I think, that, and the value is not in the building itself, but in the process of the tradition and process of building it. So it's right. a totally different mindset. Yeah, this is great. Like um, Jiro Dreams of Sushi was a great documentary. Exactly. That's also trip. that's also like. The importance mm. of the process. Yeah, twenty years and of like, like cooking scrambled eggs, kind of thing. You and, know. and you look, and yeah, as a Western end, you look. Okay, it's just a scrambled egg. Well, mm -hmm. it, it it is not. So it's the mm -hmm. same feeling when you go to a shrine in Japan. You have to appreciate. It's not just a piece of good. There is something well, else there. There is a story and tradition. And here's something I found interesting. So I I came across um, a documentary filmmaker who. I was introduced through productive accident um, to Adrian Bellick, and he couch surfed around the world for three years making a documentary about happiness. And you know, he went to countries that rank highly on happiness, like Denmark, and countries that don't rate highly on happiness. And Japan typically does not rate highly on happiness. And I've seen it repeated in a few different mm, studies. Yes. And it's because, I guess, of the hierarchy, and you know, they don't get to really maybe. You know, they express themselves as much as they might want to, etc. But I was at a Costco um, in actually the first Costco I've ever been to. I've never been to one in the US, and it was in in uh, Ohama. Sapporo. I'm Sapporo. In, okay. Sapporo. I've been mm -hmm. me too. I've been in Costco in Japan for the first time. And <laughs> I, I, we could talk about what happened <laughs> in this Costco and, and this adventure that we had um, because it ended up becoming quite difficult to complete our purchase for different reasons. But as we were wheeling the trolleys out to the car park and there was one of their, um, their employees that was helping another family move their things to the car and he was being very um, polite and he was bowing and he was, you know, almost singing. His voice was, you know, sort of just guiding them through this, this, this uh, ramp down to the car park. But he kind of looked at me and kind of, it, I almost got a hint that he let me in to realize that he wasn't really enjoying what he was doing. He was going through the motion. It was kind of like, almost like a rolling of the eyes or a whatever, but it was it was like the matrix kind of just evaporated and you know, I saw her into what was really going on. Matrix, the matrix feeling, <laughs> the deja vu. <laughs> You've seen that before? Yes, so, if so. You, if you go to a, a, like you're checking in at, a, at an airport, and it looks like the person there, this is their life's purpose, you know, checking you in, you know, the, the, the attention to detail, the, you know, just the whole attitude. Yes. But is it a facade as well? You know, that's what I'm not sure about. Yes, there may be. I think this is an opinion. I don't I don't know. This also, of course, gener generalizing these things is very difficult. Yeah. 
it might be true. I think it might be true and might be false for other people. Mm -hmm. But to give you another, I think I've met people that they truly, really are into it, Japanese people, and some other people, no, they just, and they, they just keep changing, let's say. And it is true that in Japan there are many, and I think this is also common with Korean. There is this myth that I think is kind of true. In you, you also know about Asia. There is lots of family pressure on what you should do mm -hmm. and you, what you should not do. And I think mm -hmm. that's true. But on the other side, I found that some things or some jobs that they might feel like in other cultures, they're kind of not well regarded. I don't like that. I've learned from the Japanese that even someone, like you said, someone who is greeting you in the airport, that job is very, very important. And some people take it very seriously. I know, for example, one example, you've also been in Japanese convenience stores. Mm -hmm. There is a whole, I think there is now, there is a very good novel that is I don't know in English. It's company. It's about uh, it's about a person a, who works in a convenience store, and that's it's is their ikigai is to run the convenience store. Mm -hmm. It's a very important the convenience store, the Seven Eleven sure. or like family, and they put their lives into it. And another one is like you you've been in the bullet train in Japan. Mm -hmm. There is I learned that being being the person who is the how do you say it, the person who who gives food in the the wait the waitress in the bullet train it's regarded as a very 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 well regard it's very difficult to to get into it you need mm -hmm. to you need this whole competition to become a shinkansen waiters or waiter like mm -hmm. it's very well regarded and people are very proud to be i work mm -hmm. as a and in Spain, for example, I'm pretty sure that's like not that's not well. So I think in Japan, like from the there is much more as before we said, like the elders are respected. In Japan, all types of work or like help that you're doing for society is much more well regarded. And then of course, depending on the personality of the person, you might be and I think there is an ungrateful people everywhere in the world, or you might not like it and just want to quit, and you're just doing that because that's what you have to do at the moment. Yeah. But anyway, I think in many, general, I think in general, like Japanese are much better at appreciating sometimes those little jobs where you might feel that there is not much no, purpose. I agree. But, I agree. but for the main that's example, if, if you think Japan is like. Convenience yeah. stores, the way the clerks treat you in the convenience stores in Japan, I mm. think it's a, once you get used to it, when you go back to your country, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. there's a huge difference like there. And I don't know. No, I agree. That's why it seems such a surprise that, you know, that uh, Japan was ranking not so well on happiness in terms of surveys um, and things like that. I think that might be also, I think I, I don't try, like those. I also think like if if you ask if you do the experiment yourself and you ask Japanese, are you there are many there are many of these things to 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 that these these are subjective things. You you ask mm -hmm. questions to the population, yeah. and and depending on the culture, I think there is I'm pretty sure there's a huge bias. If you ask a Spanish person, are you happy? You're like, oh, yes, I'm drinking beers with my friends. And end of the story. If you ask a Japanese person, they are much more serious and might be much more humble. I start mm -hmm. thinking, mm, what is the meaning of happiness? Mm -hmm. mm, I'm trying to imitate. I'm not making fun of a Japanese person, but I'm trying yeah, to yeah. imitate. Mm, I don't know. I'm from zero to 100 maybe 50 so i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's they're much more humble they are not oh. like arrogant ah yeah i'm happy or i'm not yeah so I i'm pretty sure you have hundreds of people saying 
I don't know. And another example is if you ask uh, Japanese people, they're also like online, and every time is different. If it's in the 90s and 2000, and I'm sure it's the the difference is in the method, not that Japanese people are changing. Mm -hmm. If you ask them, do you believe in God or not? Like Jap you've been here in Japan. I've no, I don't know if you've made this question to Japanese people. And th there is no answer, basically. It's like very difficult to like, what, like, they will start asking you back, like, what do you mean with God? What is mm -hmm. God for you? Right. Because for, for Japanese in their mind, and I think uh, I should say not only in Japanese, but different cultures in their mind, like what the God is, like they use the concept of Shinto in Shintoism. And then there is, in, they, they have Buddhism too, and they don't care too much that they, when they get born, they follow the Shinto tradition. When they die, they get buried in Buddhist temples generally. So that there is no, and there is no one God. There is like spirits and things and beliefs. So if you ask them, do you believe in God? Then the, in the statistics, it shows like Japan doesn't believe in God. And that's that's not true totally. Mm -hmm. right. So I think with happiness is the same. Sure. It's more complicated than one uh, question. Yeah, it's very complicated thing, happiness. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm going to give you another example. Another example that I think it might be true or not is when I think condom companies they do like uh, sex statistics. Japan is the lowest in the world. Like mm -hmm. it seems like Japan doesn't have sex, and I don't know if if that's I, I don't know, but that might be also very biased because I'm pretty sure if you ask to a Japanese person, a very they are very private and they don't want to. Mm -hmm. They they are the reverse. They are not bo boasting. If they ask how many times are you having, they might say like one. I don't. I don't. They may be very shy to to answer mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you ask a French person, it's like no, I have I have sex five times per day mm -hmm. every night. Like and, and maybe the French guy is fifty years old. Is like really? Are you yeah. joking? And like but you write it down. So. <laughs> I have I have some trouble with subjective. Yeah, it makes sense. And I, no, I helpful, think actually. you you've also been a long time in Asia mm. and cultures, mm -hmm. and when the way you ask questions is very, you are adding a lot of what you believe how things right. should be. Yes, and I think for Japanese people, happiness. I don't know if it's yeah the concept of happiness is also different. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's maybe it's more of a language thing where if you were to do a survey and go, what made you smile today? Instead of, you know what I mean? Like that yeah, way they have to go. Then it's like there yeah. examples. It's, you know, I, I was talking to a friend about, you know, when you ask people what they're grateful for is like some people like take that word and it means like it's it's tough to answer. Right. But if you said what brought you joy today? You know what I mean? That is something you're grateful for. If I say, what brought you joy? You know, what made you, again, what made you smile? You know, these are all things that tie into gratitude. More, you know, yeah, too. that's more concrete. Yeah, maybe, it's like, I can say, we should do a next study on, on Asian happiness. We should design hmm. the questions or we can like do that. a gratefulness study. See hmm. How grateful are people? I, I'm that. down, man. You're speaking my language right here, man. I'm all day long. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> But I know we've been keeping you. I know you said you only had an hour and a half, so I, I, we should probably wrap it up. I, I've really enjoyed all this time. And um, I would do want to get a picture with us in our books, though. We did do that. So oh, let's okay. let's get the get the big smile with the authors. Okay, I'm going to show two of my latest. There we uh, go. Oh, get you get <laughs> Hector, get uh, your face in there a little bit. Uh, uh, okay, so <laughs> okay, uh, okay, okay like this. All right, that's cool. That's cool. I'll take a screenshot later. Are we good? Okay, we're good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, heck, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, Peter, do you have any thoughts? Any uh, final thoughts here? Yeah, no, I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I'm going to go back and have a closer look at your earlier books. Um, yeah, I was looking at uh, Ichigo, Ichia, and. I can't hear you, Peter. Hector, can you hear Peter? Uh, yes. You can hear me? 
Okay. Uh, I can, so that's yeah. weird. All right. Keep going, guys. I'll just turn my mic, change something setting here. I don't know what happened. Okay. Yeah, no, um, I really enjoyed the conversation, uh, Hector. I think it'd be great to catch up in, in Tokyo or if you're ever over in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, and just continue some of these these conversations. And, and you've prompted quite a few ideas around writing and editing and everything else. So really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for having me. And yes, see you next time both. Maybe Absolutely. Tokyo, Hong Kong, or Kentucky. Absolutely. Or maybe Hokkaido, Niseko. Perfect. Look forward to it. Thank you. I think Chris is dialing back in. There he is. I can't hear anybody. I don't know. Okay. All right. I think we'll wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Well, We're going to end. Internal. You can drop out if you want, Hector, and I think Chris will just edit this out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.